so, if I were just to ask the question, are, are we secure in Christ Jesus? Are we saved and secure in Christ? Right? All right, so some of you are going to, yes, right? right? And, and, and so there's different ways we can ask that question, right? We could ask it another way, and we could say, can a person lose their salvation? Right? That's been a, a much talked about topic throughout um, throughout the, the decades, people have talked about the possibility. Can you lose your salvation? And some of you are going, well, I, I, you know, you have different phrases ringing in your ears. Maybe you have this idea of once saved, always saved. Right? That's a popular way to present the truth. It's not my favorite way. I'll just be honest. I don't love it. People have abused it greatly. Um, and so I, I, I'd like to stay away from that a little bit. I prefer the term eternal security. Um, and, and, and even more so, we connect that with, with the idea of the perseverance of the saints. And we see both in the scripture. So I don't want to, I don't want to manipulate, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to lay it out for you. So, uh, for, for me and for us as a church, the answer to the question, can you lose your salvation is really quite simple. It, it has to do with who saved you. Right. It really is that simple. Who saved you? If God saved you, then you cannot lose it. Right? It, it's that clear. And we'll, I'll, I'll show it in the scripture. If you saved you, well, good luck. Right? That's, if, if, if my salvation were based on my ability to keep it, I would be, I would be lost. I would be forever lost. But my salvation is not dependent upon me, right? So I, I think if, if you're wrestling with that question this morning, I, like I said, I want to answer from the scripture, but I want to be up front that we believe in eternal security. We believe that a person who is truly saved, a person who is in Christ, will forever and eternally be saved. And that's important as we come to this passage. We're flowing out of what is the most, one of the most, maybe the most familiar verse in the book of Romans, Romans 8, 28, right? All things. Like, well, you know what? Let's read it, right? <laughs> we'll read our context here. Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Right? We stopped there last week. And, 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 and we said, we know this to be true. We are confident in this. We are confident. God is working all things together for good. That's an incredible promise, isn't it? It's a glorious promise and one in which we love. But understand this. If, if the verses we're looking at this morning are not true, then Romans 8.28 is merely wishful thinking. Right? If, if we just look at it isolated and we don't understand what he's about to say in verses 29 and 30, then we have no assurance on which we can stand. But because verses 29 and 30 are true, then verse 28 is true, and that is really good news for us this morning. All right, so let's read verses 29 and 30, which says, For, see the connecting there? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Amen. All right. We, finished, we, we, we did our elder meeting yesterday. We said, let's go home. Right? I mean, it's, that's, that's enough, right? It is enough. But let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on his word. And we'll dig into this a little bit. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming together this morning. And now as we come to this portion of the service where we open up your word, we pray that you would open our eyes to see and understand these glorious truths more clearly. We do pray for the salvation of the lost. We ask that you would sanctify your people and that you would strengthen our faith. May we leave knowing you better than when we came. And Lord, may you be glorified in all that is said and done. In spite of me, we ask it in Jesus' name. And amen. All right, so... Verses 29 and 30 are answering a question for us, right? If all things are working 
together for good. How does that happen? And what is the good? Right? That's important. Right? And we answered some of those misunderstandings last week. I don't have time to go back. So if you missed it, you can catch those on our, our YouTube page or Facebook page. You can go back and listen to Romans 8.28. But we can, flowing out of that, answer the question. Right? How, how do all things work together for good? Understanding there's qualifications, right? To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. But how, how do those things work for good? And what is that ultimate good that is being worked out? All right, so I just want to right up front state that God is the main actor in these verses. Right? In verse 28, in verse 29, in verse 30, it is God who is working all things together for good. Right? He's the one who is moving. He's the one who is working all things according to what? His purpose. Right? Don't miss that. Right? We're connecting it to verse 28, but notice in verse 29, there are five verbs in verse 29. Right? So verbs are action words. Somebody is, somebody is doing something. And in verse 29 and 30, these five verbs, who is the actor? God is the actor. Right? God is the one who is doing these things. So let's just look at them very quickly. What are these five things that God is doing to bring about his ultimate good? Well, it says he foreknew, right? That's one. He also predestined. That's two. Verse 30, those whom he predestined, he also called. That's three. And those whom he called, he also justified. That's four. And then finally, those whom he justified, he also glorified right five action words all he did right he he is god the one who is working all things according to his purpose we must start there right we must start there we must understand that when it comes to our salvation god is the main actor he is the one who is doing the work I need you to see that. From beginning to end, throughout the centuries, theologians have called verses 29 and 30 the golden chain of salvation. Right? They just picture it here as five links in a chain all together. And, and that's important because each of these verbs are linked together here in such a way that if one of them is true of you, then all of them are true of you. Do you see what I'm saying? If, if he foreknew you, then you are called. If he predestined you, then you are glorified. You can't separate one from the other. Right? That's, they're intricately, intricately, blah, intricately connected, right? And, and, it's, and so it is, as we see, right? The group that God starts out with in verse 29 is the group that he finishes with in verse 30. So when we ask the question, can you lose your salvation? What do we see here? Not one, not one falls through the cracks. Not one. Those whom he foreknew, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. Right? You see how this chain, it, it goes from beginning to end, holding together a chain that cannot be broken. And, and, and notice, this chain begins in eternity past. And it goes to eternity future. It's something that God has done before time. And it's something that God will do in the future forever and ever. It's a remarkable chain that shows us the picture of salvation. From the divine perspective particularly. And so let's just look at these individually. What is it that God does? Well, it starts out in verse 29 saying, He for knew he foreknew now right every link in this chain is essential but this first link is the one that i believe is probably the most misunderstood right it's a compound word and it means to literally know beforehand right to know beforehand and so the reason it's misunderstood i think is because we have in our mind we think we know what it means 
you think about God knowing something beforehand, you say, well, that has to do with his omniscience. Well, God knows everything. He knows everything that has happened. He knows everything that's going to happen, right? God knows everything. And so you, you have in your mind, right, well, if God knows everything, then, yeah, of course he knows all about salvation. And he knows, he knows who's going to choose him and who's not going to choose him. And so you start reading into this verse and saying, right, well, he foreknew. But I want you to notice, it doesn't say he foreknew certain facts. It doesn't say God looked down through the corridors of time and he knew ahead of time who would do this and who would do that. It doesn't say that at all, does it? Does God know everything? Yes, but when it says he foreknew, what is he talking about here? It says those whom he foreknew. Who are those? Those who are called according to his purpose in verse 28. Those who love God. Here it says he foreknew People, right? Individuals. It doesn't say he knew facts. It says he knew people. And if we know anything about the scriptures, when we talk about knowing people, when we talk about knowing individuals, we're not just saying that God knows about them. I mean, if we were to go to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 2, and it, it says, Adam knew his wife Eve. Some of you are going to catch up with me here. All right. Does that mean that Adam just oh, was aware of her? He knew that there was this woman in the garden? That's not at all what it means, does it? It means that he knew her intimately. Right? And when we look at the scriptures, the Bible talks about God knowing Abraham. And it talks in Amos chapter 3 about God knowing his people Israel. So when it says he foreknew in the scripture... It's saying he knew us relationally. He knew us intimately beforehand. That's hard for us to wrap our minds around. But I can give you an example, right? Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. He tells Jeremiah, Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, before I formed you in the womb, right? That's before he was ever thought about by mother or father, right? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I knew you. Jeremiah, I knew you before you were ever born. And what? I ordained you a prophet. Right? So before, before Jeremiah lived, before he was ever born or thought about, God knew him and had ordained a path for him. You with me? All right, so... When we come to the New Testament, we see similar language. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I just want you to see this because, again, we misunderstand what it means. 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 3 says, But if anyone loves God, right? Now that's what we're talking about, right? Those who love God, Romans 8, 28. If anyone loves God, he is known by God. He is known by God. So what does that mean? That means that God knows them on a relational level, an intimate level. So I, I just want you to understand this term, foreknown. It doesn't mean that God knows about you. He's aware of you, right? God knows everything. He knows all facts, right? There's no one in the world that he's not aware of. But this word is different. He's not talking about what you might do. In fact, if we misunderstand that, it just robs us of the grace of God. For those who would look at this verse and say, well, God just looked through the corridors of time and he knew who would respond to him and who would not. And so based on their choice, their response, he chose them. That's how lots of people talk about foreknowledge. It's not true, right? It's an error. It's, it's not a correct understanding of the scriptures. Why? Because in that scenario, who gets the glory? If God... God bases his choice on what you do, well, then it's about you. God just looked down and said, oh, look at that guy right there. He picked me. He's so smart. I, I, I'd like him to be part of my family. Right? That's, that's not foreknowledge. That's not grace. God's grace is him saving us apart from anything we do. And, and so foreknowledge here is something deeper than just knowing facts. In fact, 
when you look at the scripture there in Matthew chapter 7 for those who are not in Christ when they stand before him Jesus says to them what depart from me I never knew you is Jesus saying to them I didn't know about you I wasn't aware of you no not at all he's saying we didn't have a relationship right so i know we spent some time to highlight that but it's important you understand that when we talk about foreknowledge here right talking about god working all things according to his for those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose those are people he foreknew when did that happen when did god know us well we read it in our scripture meditation this morning in ephesians 1 4 it says he shows us before the foundation of the world Whew. right that's an incredible thought right in fact if you really want to read this word in a way that highlights what it means you could say god for loved us he for loved them he set his affection on you before the foundation of the world right. this is the beginning of the chain right god in eternity past, in the good counsel of his will, according to nothing but his sovereign grace, loved you. That's true of you if you are in Christ. And I know, right? There, you're you're going to go, well, doesn't God love everyone? Yes, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves everyone. He loves all of his creation. But let's be clear God has a special love for his people, right? I love children, right? I come to church on Sunday morning, and I see your kids running around. I love it, and I love them, and I pray for them. But I don't love your children the way I love my children. My children are mine. I have a special love for my children. So yes, God loves, but God has a unique, special love for his children. And that's what we're talking about in Romans chapter 8, right? We've been adopted into his family. We are heirs and fellow heirs with Christ. So if you find yourself in Christ this morning, if you understand the nature of this, sometime in eternity past, God set his affection on you. God loved you from eternity past in a unique, special way. That's an incredible thought. Man, I'd like to press deeper, but we're going to move forward. What is God doing? Link number one, he foreknew. And then he says, those he foreknew, he also predestined. Right? That's one of those words that people don't like. In fact, sometimes people come to me and they'll say, Preacher, do you believe in predestination? You know what? I just have to just open up the Bible, <laughs> right? And, and, and we'll just open up the scripture. We could read Romans 8, 29. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined. Do I believe in predestination? Of course I believe in predestination because the, it's a biblical concept. It's a biblical word. We don't just, because we don't like an idea, we don't just toss it out. Right? We read it twice in Ephesians 1 this morning. In Ephesians 1, and verse 5, it says, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 1, in verse 11, it says, We have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him. Do I believe in predestination? I have to believe in predestination if I believe the Bible. I have to. Right? In fact, right, this really is... The answer to the question when it comes to predestination, do you believe the Bible is the word of God? Do, do you believe it is the final authority? Right? Do you believe the Bible? If you believe the Bible, then you believe in predestination. Now, you may try and explain it different ways. You might, try to, you might even try and explain it away, but it's here and we can't ignore it, right? And so even if you don't like the concept, it's a biblical concept. And, and, and maybe you're saying, well, the idea of predestination, Pastor, it, that makes me a little uncomfortable. When you start talking about predestined, and it has the idea that God decided things ahead of time. Yep. <laughs> That's exactly what it means. 
right? It, it means literally that, that God marked out boundaries before time, that he determined beforehand. That's what it means, right? We, you say, that makes me really uncomfortable. I don't like the idea of a God who is determining things without my input. <laughs> if that makes you uncomfortable, then I would say, good. It should. It should make you uncomfortable. This truth puts us in our place, does it not? It, God is God. You are not God. God is God. Let this truth humble you this morning. Those whom he foreknew, those whom he set his affection and his love on, he predestined. He marked out boundaries. He determined beforehand the outcome. Now you say, does that mean I don't have any choices to make? That's not at all what it means. In fact, what it really means is this. God's going to take your choices, whatever you choose and whatever you don't choose, and he's going to use those choices to bring about his ultimate purpose for your good and his glory. That's what it means. God is going to accomplish his purpose. So those whom he foreknew, those whom he set his love on in eternity past, he predestined. And again, I, man, I know it brings questions up in your mind. And some of those questions we're going to answer as we move forward in the book of Romans. So I don't have time to go much deeper, but I just want to say this morning, the truth of predestination is not something that is meant to be debated. And it's not meant to cause division. Every time we see this truth in the scripture, it is meant to do two things, right? First and foremost, it is what we read in Ephesians 1, to the praise of his glory. It highlights and glorifies God in his grace, in his love, in his salvation, Right? Salvation from beginning to end is all of him. And secondly, what we see in Romans 8 is, it is meant to bring us great comfort. We can be secure in Christ, knowing that he is going to accomplish his purpose. That if God has set his affection on you, if he foreknew you and he predestined you, then guess what? He's going to Bring it to its full and final end. So yes, you should feel great comfort from Romans chapter 8 this morning. And maybe, as we talk about predestination, some of you are going, Preacher, you can't talk about stuff like that. Because as soon as you start talking about God securing people for all eternity and not losing their salvation and being predestined from eternity past, well, then you give people permission to live however they want. You ever heard that? Maybe some of you think that. Like, you can't talk about not losing your salvation because then people are just going to go out and do whatever. Well, let's, let's keep reading, right? Let's let the word form our thoughts about what God is saying here. All right, so when it says, those whom he foreknew... He predestined, notice the goal and purpose of God in predestination. He predestined them to what? To be conformed to the image of his son. What is God's predetermined purpose? That we will be made like Jesus. That's the ultimate goal. That's the outcome, right? That's what God is doing in those he foreknew, in those he predestined. He's making them more and more like Jesus. We are being, according to 2 Corinthians 3, transformed from one degree of glory to another. This is the sanctification process we've been looking at all year. That we are being made more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is God's purpose. His purpose is to make us like his son. Now, think about that for a moment. If when God saves a person, he begins the process of making them more like Jesus. 
can we see someone who says, well, they, they, they call themselves a Christian, but they just live however they want. Right. Is that person really born again? Is that person truly a Christian? Now, we don't know hearts and we don't know minds, but we know the Scripture. And the Scripture says that those who are in Christ are being made more and more like Jesus. Not perfectly, mind you, right? We talked about that in chapter 7. We fail, we fall, but we keep persevering. And this is all the work of God in us. So this absolutely just throws that right out the window. There's no thought in which someone can just, they can be saved, right? They can say, yeah, I believe on Jesus and I'm on my way to heaven and I'm just going to live my life how I want until then. That's not true salvation, right? Those who have been born again, those who are in Christ Jesus are going to be conformed to the image of his son. You know what that means? That means God is making them holy like Jesus. That means God is making them love like Jesus. That means God is going to cause them to conform to his will, the way that Jesus conformed to his will. Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He's making us more like Christ. It's a process that began in eternity past, but which God is bringing to full fruition in his people. He foreknew you. He predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. Oh, let's finish the chain. Verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. What does it mean to be called? Well, it's an invitation, right? Come, right? Come. God invited god called you say didn't god invite everyone yeah there's an there's a general invitation we find in the scripture right come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden come there's an open invitation that i can give this morning to every single one here everyone within the sound of my voice if that if those airways or internet take it to zimbabwe or or india or africa they can hear the invitation come Come, there's a general call in the scriptures to all people. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17 says, The spirit and bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. It's an open invitation. God gives a general call. That is not what he's talking about here in Romans chapter 8. He's not talking about an open, general call. You say, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, because of what he says. He says, those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. Those who experience this call experience justification. Right? That means this is a different kind of call. Because not everybody who hears the general call is justified, right? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> we could just... Proclaim the gospel, and everywhere they heard the good news, the general call, they were saved. But that's not reality. There are people who receive that call, and there are people who reject that call. But here, all who receive this call are justified. They're saved, right? Because, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, right? So this call is not a general call. It's a, theologians call it an effectual call. Those whom he foreknew, those who he set his love on in eternity past and predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, he calls. And this call is one that is certain. If God set his love and affection on you, when he calls, you will respond. You'll respond. The best way that I can explain this is, um, is from John chapter 11. Right? I mean, in John chapter 11, we have Lazarus dead in the tomb. Four days. His family is weeping. They, they, they miss him deeply, right? If his family were to go to the tomb and say, Lazarus, come, come on, come out. If they were to offer a call for Lazarus to come, what would he do? Nothing. Because he's dead. He's dead. He would not respond. Because he could not respond. 
And this is the way the Bible describes people in their sin apart from Christ. They are dead in trespasses. But when Jesus shows up at the tomb of Lazarus, and he stands outside his tomb, and he says, Lazarus, come forth! The dead man gets up and he comes out. That is a picture of the effectual call that takes place in salvation. Though we are dead in our sin, when God calls us effectually, we respond. He, he quickens, he makes us alive where we were dead. He opens our blind, eye, our blind eyes and gives us eyes to see Christ in a way that we could not before. When he says, come, we come. Isn't that good news? God set his love on us. He predestined us. He called us. And those whom he called, he justified. Now listen, we don't, we're not going to take a lot of time to unpack that this morning. The entire first five chapters of Romans, we talked about justification. It's good, and it's beautiful, and it's glorious, and it's true here. Right? Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. Right? It's a legal term. It means to be declared innocent so that when God looks upon his children, it's just as if they never sinned. Justified. Declared innocent. I think it's enough for us this morning just to recognize this is a link in the chain. Right? We're moving from eternity past to present. Right? Eternity past for new, predestined. Present time, he calls us and he justifies us. Oh, but the chain is not complete. Right? Because in verse 30, it says, those whom he justified, those who come to him by faith in Christ, he also glorified. That's the final link in the chain. Right? And and what I want you to see is this is a done deal. What does it mean that God glorifies his children? Well, it means that they are going to share in this glorified life. They're ultimately going to be like Jesus. That we, that this, this body of death, this sinful flesh will be done away with. I saw my call before his surgery this week and we were just talking about this verse together and weeping over the idea weeping together over the thought that there's coming a day when this flesh is going to be done away with and we're going to have new glorified bodies that no longer no longer have to deal with sin no longer experience the effects of sin This is what Jesus says is going to happen, right? This is the link in the chain. But notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say they will be glorified. That's what we expect, right? That's the way in which we've seen it so far in Romans chapter 8. It's always been talked about in the future tense. If you go back to verse 18, he says, I consider the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. <laughs> There's a future time when this is going to be true, right? But here, when we're talking about our salvation from a divine perspective, those whom he foreknew in eternity past, he also glorified. Past tense. Now that doesn't mean we're there yet. What that means is this. It means that it is as good as done. Right? Paul looks at this and he just says this. It's as if you can count on it with such certainty and assurance that I can say that it has already happened. Yes, it's going to happen when we see Christ face to face, right? We do not know what we shall be, but we know that when we see him, we will be like him. Right? It is certainly future to come. We wait for it with patience, according to Romans 8. But in the divine plan of God, it is certain. So that what Paul says in Philippians 1, 6 he who began a good work in you will complete it. And 
until the day of Christ. From beginning to end, brothers and sisters, salvation is all of God. It's all of God. Why are you saved? You say, well, because I believe. And, and, and that's true, and, right? I mean, you, you cannot be saved apart from faith and repentance. We're looking at this from a divine perspective, though. And even if we look at the scripture, right? Why do you believe? For by grace are you saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Even the faith to believe comes from him. Had God not opened your eyes, had God not called you and awakened you and regenerated you, you would not believe in him. You would not. Salvation is all of God from beginning to end. Now, one last question to answer and we'll finish up. Why does God do it? Why does he do it? Why did he set his affection on us? Why did he predestine us? Why did he call us? Why did he just, why did he, why did he do it? Maybe you're going, Pastor, you skipped a part. I did. Because I want to finish here. In verse 29, we have a purpose statement, right? In order that. In order that. Why did he foreknow and predestine us? In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Who's the he? It's Christ, right? We're being conformed to the image of Jesus in order that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, firstborn can talk about first as in, right, being born first, which is true for Christ. But this is more than that. It has the idea of preeminence. He is the ultimate. He is the heir. He is the one who is over all things. So that we can say God foreknew and predestined and called and justified and will glorify. Why? In order that Jesus might be first. Your salvation ultimately is meant to glorify Christ. It's all about him. It's all about him. This matters. It matters in the heart of God. This is why. You say, why? Why does God do this? And, and I don't have all the answers to your questions. Some will answer as we move forward. Some are impossible for us to reconcile in our mind. But what we do know is God is working all things First and foremost, we saw in Ephesians 1, to the praise of his glory. But yes, for our good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So what does that mean for us this morning as we, as we move forward? The applications are many, but I'm going to highlight a few here. All right, so number one. It means there is a general call going out this morning. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Come, come, all you who labor and are heavy laden, he will give you rest. There's a general call. If you do not have this salvation, if you do not have this life in Christ, the invitation is extended to you this morning. And maybe you just say, well, Preacher, how do I know if I'm one of those predestined people? Well, if, if you would believe, if you would believe you are his. If God would so open your eyes to come and put your trust in Jesus Christ, then you know. Right? We don't have to play games with this. General invitation this morning. But for those who are in Christ Jesus this morning... It means, brothers and sisters, that he will hold you fast. <laughs> it means that this chain of salvation is unbreakable. And yes, you are eternally secure in Christ. Why? Because God has saved you. You didn't save you. God saved you. And he who began a good work in you will complete it. We are secure. In him. All for his glory. Can I finish in, in, in 1 Corinthians? <laughs> All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
I want you to leave with this thought in mind. I'm going to start in verse 26. I'm not going to preach this, but I just want you to hear it. For consider your calling, brothers. He's talking to those who are in Christ, right? Those who believe in For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, that's how we want to finish this morning. We want to boast in the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. The salvation that is ours is only ours because God has accomplished it from beginning to end. To God be the glory. Let's let's pray and then we'll sing together. Lord, thank you so much.